Thank you, Big. Very, very kind introduction of all of us, of all the speakers. And um, I would like to, to, well, thank you in the same way, vice versa, because it has been a long friendship with us and um, to, between Germany and Great Britain, especially in sleep disordered breathing. And we, I think I have learned a lot from your, um, your work on drug-induced sleep endoscopy, especially, and all the other thoughts we shared during many conferences. Thank you. Well, it's quite nice to add on some ideas to what Olivier just said. Um, some conflicts of interest, well, yeah, nothing to deal with the nose, um, but there is, of course, a problem when we talk about the nasal breathing and the CPAP failure. Olivier addressed that just now. And if you look at a recent study by Lam et al, then in, well, not thousands of patients, but at least 156, you see many reasons why those patients, where do we have, there is the pointer, why those patients have problems with using CPAP. And all the ones where I put an arrow, I think they can be related to nasal breathing problems. Might it be claustrophobia, where you don't ask correctly, and in, real, in reality, it's a nasal problem? Mask discomfort, very often. Um, if you ask closer, then you will find out it's a nasal problem. Sleep difficulties, we heard about that recently. The inability to keep the mask on, of course, that's very often linked to nasal problems. Suffocation, congestion, clearly nasal problems. And also air leak somewhere is very often linked to an obstruction during the, the, um, the night. The other things may be, but not that, that likely. And if you then look at the symptoms, which are in, found in this group of patients with CPAP failure, then the nasal obstruction is severe or extreme in more than 35%, here exactly 36%. And also another quarter approximately has a moderate nasal obstruction. So only one third of this group had no or only minimal nasal obstruction. So it seems to be really important to talk about nasal obstruction. But if you then add questions about the sleep quality itself, the quality of life and the daytime sleepiness here measured by the functional outcomes of sleep questionnaire, the insomnia severity index, and then here nasal um, questionnaire, and the Epworth sleepiness uh, score, then you find high correlations of all of these. So sleepiness, quality of life, and um, insomnia problems, high, well-correlated um, issues with the nasal obstruction. So that means that in patients with CPAP failure, all the symptoms very often are highly correlated to the nasal obstruction. So that just to add on some data regarding the um, obstruction of the nose and CPAP problems. So I would like to add a few ideas to what you've already heard about these issues. So I think the, the most um, challenging study, um, 10 years old, has been published by a Greek group, and they had a randomized trial of nasal surgery for fixed nasal obstruction, so a sham septoplasty, where not even the nurse knew exactly whether septoplasty was performed during that operation, that sham operation. And they found no difference of the AHI before and after surgery, and also many case series showed the same. But now, when we look at a very recent um, systematic review here published in 2017, they put 17 studies together and they came out with um, this random effect uh, model that there was a significant reduction of the AHI, but only by 4.15 um, events per hour. Of course, we can ask whether this is um, clinically relevant. If you look then further about these symptoms which are linked to um, CPAP problems and to patients having sleep apnea, then they also had 11 studies where the daytime sleepiness was um, assessed exactly before and after surgery. And I point to the fact that this is the subjective sleepiness. There were no objective measurements. But it seems that this subjective tiredness and sleepiness which sometimes is put together by patients, 
um, is relevant. And if you have then a reduction of four points in that 24 points scale of the Epworth sleepiness scale, then this is clinically relevant for many patients. Again, that was um, significant. And if you look then in a group to add on this sleepiness issue, the sleepiness um, item, if you now compare a group of patients who had obstructive sleep apnea, and some of them received CPAP and others received surgery, nasal surgery alone, then 40 each in, that, in these groups, then nasal surgery did not improve AHI, we heard that, only minimally. But oxygenation was improved and sleep quality, whereas CPAP improved all parameters. However, and that is quite striking, I think, the daytime sleepiness, as measured by the ESS, decreased more significantly in the nasal surgery group. We wouldn't expect that. So both had a reduction, but in the nasal surgery group, the reduction was more pronounced. If we then go on to CPAP adherence, which is of course important. If you use such a treatment, it's important to use it, not only to have it in your wardrobe. Then a distinction between those using CPAP and those not using CPAP showed that the nasal resistance was one of the major um, factors um, pointing towards an initial CPAP adherence or initial, initial CPAP rejection regardless of symptoms. And if you then go to longer use CPAP, then there has been a meta-analysis by Camacho, who performed many systematic reviews, but also on, on nasal problems and CPAP use. And he could show that in about 100 patients only, we should think there should be much more publications, but there aren't, about regular use, adherence, and or tolerance increasing from about 40% to 90%, which is tremendous. And in those patients who could not use CPAP before, 89% um, could start using CPAP after nasal surgery. So they accepted it, they adhered to it, or they tolerated it after surgery. And the objective hours of sleep, of sleep using the CPAP device increased from three to 5.5 hours, which is then um, crossing the border from non-sufficient um, non adherence to sufficient adherence, which is thought to be about four hours per night. And the treatment group in a placebo control, uh, control, control trial, oh sorry, that is um, 0 0.08, so just hit, not hitting the significance level, it increased only by 32 minutes at one month in that um, controlled trial. So um, it's not that clear on the short term, but on the long term. And of course, you, we all know that the CPAP pressure can be reduced relevantly. And um, you can see here by 2.66 um, centimeters of water in this um, sample of 82 patients. And it's more important in the reduction is more pronounced if you add turbinate surgery to septoplasty compared to single interventions. But the patient number is also quite low. And if you look at the daytime, um, if you look at those using a nasal mask only um, here, then it's less patients, but still then the effect is more pronounced with 2.8 centimeters of water pressure reduction. So the others were with nasal or or nasal masks. It's not mentioned in these trials. And of course, we can enable other therapies by improving nasal breathing, by surgery. Um, not only talking about the mandibular advancement devices, but um, if you look at this nice study from um, the um, group of Schelkigar, where they have, over the years, a scheme looking at different interventions in CPAP failure. And look at the nasal surgery. There are always, in these early years, very little nasal surgery, but then it's about a third to 60% who underwent nasal surgery in order to treat their problems when, use, when not being able to use CPAP. But of course, also palatal surgery, oral appliances, weight management, mask interface problems, 
tracheostomy even, um, orthognatic surgery, genioglossal advancement, hyoid, so, um, hyoid suspension, tongue-based surgery, and hypoglossal nerve stimulation very recently. So it plays a major role in the treatment of patients with CPAP failure. And that is the study you already mentioned. And um, you see just here now how they did it. They compared um, the, the cost of the intervention with or without complications, and then the cost of untreated sleep apnea, and of treated, of course. And you saw the data um, mentioned by Olivier van der Weken now, but the red part is where it becomes more cost effective to have the intervention done, and the blue is the time you have to wait. So with septoplasty, it takes quite a long time until it is really cost effective, but with a minimally well, with a cheaper intervention such as turbinoplasty, it is very early on already cost effective. So I'd like to conclude. Um, OZA and nasal congestion, and it seems that daytime sleepiness and the feeling of tiredness is even more important than the apnea hypopnea index in terms of hypertension, morbidity, cardiovascular risk, as recent data show. I didn't show you the slides, but that is under discussion at the moment. And they both affect sleep quality, daytime sleepiness, and quality of life. And nasal obstruction is a common reason for CPAP failure and correlates with poor sleep in that group. Nasal surgery improves the AHI, maybe significantly, but in reality, irre irrelevantly. But it improves sleep and daytime sleepiness relevantly. And nasal surgery reduces CPAP pressure and it improves adherence. So, as a, let's say, overall conclusion, it plays a major role in obstructive sleep apnea patients. And it's cost-effective. Thank you. <laughs>